So um, I usually start out these talks with new versions of, of, of C-sharp by sort of asking the audience, uh, what, what is the feature that we're missing? Uh, and that's still a great question. I'd still be curious. But I, I thought maybe this time what I'd do is actually show a program. Uh, it's a really simple one. So we'll just do a .NET, .NET new uh, console dash dash name. We'll call this C sharp 10. I want to do a do type. Um, I've essentially, oh, hello. I don't have a screen here. What's going on? And we'll go into, I don't know if that's showing up my files. What did it do here? Did get an error? Yeah, I got it. And we'll go ahead and pull up a, a Hello World program. And to start, I want to ask the question, what would make this simpler? What can we do that would make this code simpler? Okay, so I'll take one at a, one at a time. Uh, there was one suggestion, hey, we should get rid of the curly braces. Do you have any specific ones you had in mind when you said that? Lines four and line 12. And it turns out, if we start programming in C sharp 10, we can get rid of lines 4 and 12. And I should probably delete, um, make this done in 6. OK. Um, I'll, I'll try to do that. So one, one option here is to go get ahead and get rid of um, the, the curly brackets on, names, on, on namespace. And it turns out that that's a C sharp, a C -sharp 10 feature. Uh, what we've now been coding since C sharp 1.0, we always go and put the curly braces. And I'll, I'll get rid of these um, weird brackets here as well, uh, the errors. But um, first thing is, let's just go ahead and delete the curly braces. And there's no reason to have those. They're not really yelling value. The idea originally, of course, was, well, what if you wanted to have multiple namespaces within your file? If you wanted to have multiple namespaces in your file, then we clearly need to demark where they begin and where they end, so we should go put curly braces. But how many of you have coded something in the last, I don't know, to say 20 years, where you've gone ahead and put multiple namespaces in a single file? Yeah, it's not very common. Um, you might have done it. You might have done it. You might have done it if you, for example, were writing a book and wanted to show the use case. But other than that, you've probably never gone ahead and put multiple namespaces in a single file. Because generally, we only have one class in a single file. So since you only have one class in a single file, why would you bother to go put multiple namespaces in the same file for the one single class that you have? You're most likely going to just have one. And we had a couple people raise, raise their hand. I'm curious to know what this scenario was. But they're Python programmers, so we won't really count them. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's a great suggestion that we should we should go ahead and just and just remove it. What what's another simplification that we could make to this code if we were just you know trying to sort of teach C sharp or get somebody started in C sharp? Go ahead. You don't have to use system. Well, we could we could we could. I mean, what if we went ahead and removed system? Um, that's a, that's an interesting scenario. Uh, what does system allow us to do? It, it allows us to call console and actually know where where that console is located. Um, so if we're going to remove system, there has to be some way to specify or identify where console is located. It's, it's a reasonable way to simplify. And if I was trying to code hello world, that's a, a, good, a good change. It's way too much complexity if I have to do it. But I, I think we can sort of reasonably believe that there has to be some way to identify that console is within scope. Okay, so we'll just pretend for the moment, but it's a valid, it's a valid simplification. Let's remove the complexity of having to identify, you know, that system, the system is necessary. Um, good. What else? 
Get, get rid of Maine. Uh, and, and it's going to be a little bit difficult to get rid of Maine um, because we have something else there. What, what's the other thing that's preventing us from just getting rid of Maine? No, why, why, what's this whole class stuff? Like I've got a single thing, it does one, it's got one line of code. Do I really need to specify which class that, that is in? What if I could just, you know, put, put main, main there? And then while we're about, I mean, we don't really need to have methods because we've only got one statement here. It's really not, it doesn't seem necessary to go ahead and do that. And then, you know, while I'm about to forget namespaces altogether. You know what, that's really not, it's not adding significant value. And we get down to the hello world example that is, is totally possible with Python, but is not being possible with C Sharp for, for the beginning of time since C Sharp started. So, you know, in this case, we're now competitive with Python. That's all it took. We just eliminate everything, and we've got one line of code, and we're, we're, down, we're down to the beginning. Um, now, it turns out the reason why this, this, I showed you that example, I did a .NET new, uh, but I sort of had a trick up my sleeve. If you'll notice here, I've got a global here. Um, a global.json file that says, hey, go back one version, and let's use the .NET version, .NET 5 version of the templates. And because I chose specifically to use a .NET 5 version of templates, it went ahead and created a Hello World example that was significantly, significantly more complex. But I could change that and delete that. So let's delete that global.json. Um, so the question was, what about print hello world? Let me see if I still my code open. I don't have my code open. Give me one second, I'll come back to the question. So I'm going to delete global, and then I'm going to go ahead and put in here uh, .NET new console dash name, and we've already got C sharp 10, so let's delete. Oh, that's not very nice. Let's put a name in here, we'll make C sharp. Ten uh, new. We should put a dash dash name in there. And now let's go ahead and look at program again. And we're down to one line, one line of code. Um, the suggestion was made, hey, what if we went ahead and we could also remove, uh, we could just have it be print. And, and I would suggest that whether it says print or right line is, is, is just, you know, I, you know, it's just naming. I, in this case, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna sweat over whether it should be print or right line, but it is, it is a worthwhile statement. What if we went ahead and just did that? That, that seems like a reasonable, a reasonable improvement for us to go, to go make to the code. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about that. Um, if I went ahead and pulled up some code, what am I in here? We're still in VS Code. As it turns out, we can now do all those things that we've just talked about and actually get that program to work. And if you did a .NET new, like I showed you, you end up with one line of code for Hello World if you're writing a console app. Uh, and, and so we're sort of set on the right track for making these, these improvements. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and open it up to start. Uh, the first thing is, is the suggestion that was actually made, made, made first here by Seth, I believe. Uh, the, the suggestion was, hey, let's get rid of the curly braces. So let's go ahead and talk about namespaces. Since we only have one namespace in a file, do we really need to have curly braces at all? And it turns out we don't. So let's just move to what's called a file-based no, uh, namespace declaration. And in the file-based namespace declaration, we just delete the, pram, the curly braces. But there's another, what seems like subtle, but I, I think very welcome improvement in that, is I no longer need to tab all my code for everything that I declare within the file. Uh, I no longer need to tab that in. I can, I can just go ahead and do namespace, have that be at the top of the file, and then I can go ahead and declare my class um, the, the way I want it. And, and again, in this case, we still got, we still got hello world, we still got a method, but we are able to go ahead and start with those namespace declarations. 
Now, I'd like to sort of categorize uh, these improvements to the language. It's, we'll sort of talk about the categories as always use, like going forward, this will be the default, you will always use this. And then we can sort of go with, you know, frequently use, going forward, I will frequently use this. Um, and then maybe sort of occasionally used, and then lastly, that's a dumb feature uh, at the back there on the online. <laughs> okay, so we've got some people coming from other languages that, that would like to sort of make this not actually be C-sharp anymore. So, you know, that's a proposal we could, we could get into discussion about whether that's worthwhile. I mean, you could, for example, put colons at the end of your F statements if you really wanted to be Python, but, you know, I'm not sure that that's, that's a necessary improvement. Okay, thank you for, for that. I appreciate that. Um, I, Question for you. So now we get to remove curly braces. Is this something you're always going to use, frequently going to use, sometimes going to use, or this is a dumb feature? Always use when I remember. What happens when I create a new class in Visual Studio? So what is Visual Studio going to do? That's a, that's a fair enough question. Yeah, that's, that's good. But, but let's assume you're, you're writing your code in Notepad. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I think it would be reasonable to say that if Visual Studio is taking advantage of this feature, this is going to be the case. But even if you've got existing code, um, it's, well, let me ask the question again. So let's assume that Visual Studio does it. Would you like to have curly braces or no curly braces? So frequently used, sometimes used, always used. What, what's our categorization here? Fair, fair enough. Uh, so there's the, the, the comment here was, well, the IDE is going to do the indentation. I, I would suggest it's a hassle, right? Uh, to have that indentation, at some point, you're going to read so many characters on the line, like, what the heck? Do I really have to scroll across to make sure I hit my 100 character limit or 120 character limit? Or whatever you've gone ahead and decided, decided you'll call this. Um, I would suggest, at a minimum, if you're starting a new project, this will be the default, and you will always use it. Uh, and the only assumption I'm making, making there is that you're always going to have a namespace, because of course we could have no namespace, which in which case we wouldn't have it in the past or in the future in that particular scenario. I suspect that going, that you wouldn't write code without putting a namespace in the like in case you actually became an API that somebody was going to invoke you and, and, and leverage you. That 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 makes sense. Okay. Let's go ahead and continue on this, this sort of feature track here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up this, and you'll notice here that I don't have any system using system in my, in my, in my test here. So I'm using date time, I'm using assert, I'm using write line. So a suggestion was made by Jack online. He said, hey, what if we just had it could be print? I'm pre-compiling that to mean write line because I assume he means that. Uh, what if we could go write methods like this, where we no longer have to put system in there, no longer have to put a, cert, uh, uh, a namespace for the testing library, in this case, XUnit, and we no longer have to put console. And now we're starting to get down again to some of those things we eliminated before. Uh, but you'll notice I also don't have a using statement at the top of my, uh, top of my file, just like we eliminated before. However, I gave you a preview. If we can go ahead and look, there is the concept of a global using statement. And I can go ahead and declare a, a, um, a using statement with a global prefix, in which case I can say, hey, this is throughout the entire project scope. This is now possible. And in my case, since I'm writing an XUnit project, I went to get XUnit in my global scope system. And I even went as far as saying, let's imagine this is a console program. So right line is sort of understood by the person who's programming in this world a lot that when they write right line, they assume it's console.right line and not, you know, uh, nunit.right line or something like that. Um, is that global file scope to the project or to the folder? That's a good question. So the question is, is the global file scope to the project or the folder? And let me push it back on you. What would you like? I'd like to override in a subfolder. You would like to override in a, in a subfolder. So the idea, so it kind of works like global.json, where it just looks up the hierarchy to find, to find, to find the next one. Um, it turns out that if you did that, you would have to redeclare the file, and you'd be duplicating the code global.using global.xunit 
global dot whatever, and it's questionable, is you wouldn't want to add, so you wouldn't want to keep, um, you would keep duplicating the same, you know, three or four lines in every, in every single file, and you sort of be duplicating the code. The, so, so I just wanted it for that folder, but not the whole problem. Totally, totally understand. So the, the, the request that Seth's making is, I would like this to be per folder based. Um, and you, you could do that, but you have to compile the code for each folder and put it in its own uh, project. So it's project based is what I'm saying. Um, uh, it, it's project based. A at the end of the day, what was happening previously, as we all well know, is we were rewriting the same lines of code ev for every single file within our project. And if there's any place where we were all sort of breaking out in hives without realizing it, you know, the back of our mind was doing it, but we just began to accept it, it's essentially, why don't we refactor this into one place and write the code once? And, and this is the case you want to do it. Uh, of course, if you don't like the feature, then by all means don't use it and continue to write the same code over and over again. If, that, if you enjoy that you know, experience and you want to go ahead and do that, then you're welcome not to use it. It's not required. Um, so, so that's not a necessary thing to go do. Um, there's one other thing that I should mention here that's interesting is that if we look at the project that I generated using .NET 6, I did a .NET 6 console, you'll notice in here there's in, in this project we have the, um, the console.write line, I'll just put it back. We've got a console.write line in this project, and you'll notice that there is no other statements in this project. There's no use global using anywhere in this project. And the thing to ask of was, of course, well, wait, what the heck, what's going on? How do I know? And it turns out that there is this ability for you to go ahead and enable implicit usings, and then for the type of project that you're using, it will automatically figure out, well, which ones can we assume that you want to have access to? In this case, obviously, using system at a, at a minimum. And so there's a, there's a, there's a web page, you can go search on this, but there's a web page that says, hey, what is implicitly enabled by the type of project that I have? Uh, actually, by the target framework that I'm talking, so be more clear. The target framework will determine what are your implicit usings. And of course, if you don't like that and you prefer to go ahead and retype the same thing over and over again in every single file, you're welcome to do that. You just remove this and mark it as, as disabled and you won't have all those. You, you can type it to your heart's content. Mr. Kelly. What is the, the common intersection of all the music statements? Yeah, so that's a great question. So Kelly's, what Kelly's asking is, hey, how do I know which ones to go ahead and put in, which ones I don't? Well, it turns out if you go ahead and put the same statement in here, it's going to go ahead and dim it out to say, hey, you don't actually need to do this. You notice I don't have global here? It already knows that this statement is in scope. This user, sorry, not a statement, declaration. This declaration is in scope, and therefore it's going to give me a thing and say, hey, this is unnecessary code. You can probably just, just to go ahead and delete it. Um, so I think in answer to your question, yes, the, the IDE will go ahead and identify when you've got an unnecessary declaration with, within your code. Great question. Anything else? So, using statements, is this a use always? Is this a use frequently? Is this a use sometimes? Or this is a dumb feature, I'm never going to use it. All the time, yeah. Um, so the interesting thing that I, I, I don't think has been solidified yet is where do we put these global using statements? But it's not exactly clear. It turns out there's, there's, uh, you can put them in a file, a single file. You can put them in any random list of files. For us, for example, I could have put one of them in this file and one of them in another file. Um, you can also put them inside your csproj file, just the same as we can disable them. We can actually put a using, so you can put using statements within uh, your project file. I can quickly do that for you. We're looking at a project file right here. So if you went to put an item group in here, Wow, I don't have any IntelliSense, so this is a challenge, but. Yeah, what the heck. So you can go ahead and put a using statement. Uh, 
Uh, for example, you can actually, so you can put these inside your project file, in which case they're then global declarations for the entire project file. Um, and, and then you can put them in its own file. So for example, the two that I would think are most prominent, would you should have a file called globalusings.cs or a file called usings.cs, in which case you put in where you put all of the global declarations that you want to have, or you go put them all inside the project file. And I would sort of define consistency. What I would probably not do is, oh, I happen to be this in, inside this file, and I've suddenly decided JSON is really useful and should be done everywhere. Well, since I'm in this file, I'll go ahead and add the global using to this file and not to another file. Just consolidate them into one space is probably a best practice, but it is possible to put them anywhere you like. Questions? Okay, next. Yes? Are there any ramifications to uh, implicit using? So, like, yeah, so the question is, are there any ramifications to implicit using? Well, it, at least I think the question you're asking is from a performance perspective, and the answer is absolutely not. From a performance perspective, there's zero difference. There are, however, implications regarding uh, your code, how, how clear your code is, and what happens if you've got ambiguous uh, usage, right? So it turns out that, um, the Microsoft test framework has a statement called right line, and console has a statement of right line. So if I go ahead and foist sort of um, console in, or just right line into a global statement, then what does it mean when I type right line and I'm actually intending for me to use the, use the, the Microsoft.NET framework version? Um, that, that, that could be problematic. And so I think it's more from a code structure and code organization perspective. Just like anything before, when you had to decide which things you're gonna go ahead and put in your namespace, you wanna be careful and, and conscientious about what you decide to put in your namespace. And using statements within the file, you wanna be super uber you know, conscientious about what you do inside your namespace. Uh, you're using uh, declarations when you're making them global. Great question. Anything else? Okay, let's take a look at another one. Um, we have had a bunch of nullability, nullability features added to the language in the last uh, two versions, uh, both. And, and one of the things that we, they did was they wanted to go ahead and declare your intent about nullability. What did not happen is that just because you went ahead and used an exclamation point or you went ahead and defaulted stuff to be non-nullable if it was a reference type, what it didn't do was actually check uh, at runtime that the type was not nullable. Even if you declare the reference type as not nullable, you could ignore the warning and go on fat, dumb, and happy and your code would still be, uh, allow the, the, the value to be nullable. So it would be nice if we could go ahead and write a method like this, assert not null or empty, um, and then we could actually go ahead and get assertion and say, hey, this value is not null. Uh, that, that would be useful. However, if we had written the code by hand and we'd written it correctly, we, wouldn't have, we would have wanted to specify what is the name of the variable that is not null. Right? And we would use a name of statement or something like that and says, hey, we want to make sure that you know that the value is what is not null in this particular case. Rather than say, oh, we're not going to tell you which variable. You've got 10 variables coming into your method, and one of them is not null. That's not helpful. We want to identify with the name of statement. So it's basically say, you know, invalid argument, and you're always going to pass a second item that says, this is the one that's invalid. Make sense? Um, so this code is pretty cool, right? I can start write, writing one-liner uh, one -liner validation on, 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 on my parameters. In this case, I want to go ahead and validate value before I go ahead and assign it. Uh, and I want it to do all that it should do to go ahead and validate the parameter, whether it's throw an exception or, or you know, do all that magic. But it would be great if I could start to get my validation instead of having to do, you know, if this is not null, then do this and throw an argument exception and make sure you specify the argument is value, uh, for the argument name is value. Like that's, that's a pain in the patootie. Um, so I'd like to get down to this one. And if I can get down to one, one name sort of validation, this is starting to become really powerful because we could start to do, hey, Bob, what about assert matches regular expression? 
and we could start doing a cert, you know, matches, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, is it actually a valid number or whatever we decided to do with our parameter validation, which is currently a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a rigor that we have to put in our code that's a pain in the patootie. Um, so we could go ahead and do this, and it turns out that you can actually write methods that do this, and when you write the methods that do this, they will, in addition, take care of all the ceremony of identifying which, what is the name of the variable that was actually not null. So we're going to get an exception out of this, and it's going to tell us, hey, this is not null, and the thing specifically that is not null is value. But from what I'm doing right here, this is pure magic. Because I'm not passing a string, I'm not passing name of, like there's nothing besides the actual value that I'm passing. There is no metadata that's been associated with the method at all. As a user of these methods, I would use this feature a lot. There's many times, for example, if I do a logging statement, it would be great to have a logging that says, uh, this is the value of x, this is the value of y, and I just want to say, um, debug print value, and it will go say, n is equal to 23 in my, in my, in my log. So it would be, be fantastic, right? I wouldn't have to go ahead and write these methods and do all this, this rig and roll. Um, so as a user of this magic, I would say I'm going to use it frequently. Clearly it's not all the time, not every single statement. Not, not all, there's going to be places where it's not, but it's, it's frequently used. Um, as a writer, I would imagine that it's fairly rare that I'm going to write these methods, but let's take a look at what they look like. So here I've got a verify class, and if I go back, you'll notice that I had gone ahead and moved the verify class into a static declaration here, so I didn't have to prefix with the class. There is some ambiguity here as to whether you really want to go this far. Are you sure your names are unique enough? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that this is really a best practice, but it's certainly something to consider. For example, what if you had a method like not null or things like that could do that validation? Maybe it's common enough you'd want to do that. So granting me that, that sort of liberty there, we have a verify method here, and we've gone ahead and declared an assert not null or empty method in this case. Uh, assert not null empty. And it's declared just the way you would expect. We've got, a not, we've got a nullable argument, right? Because it could potentially be null here. Uh, and we're going to validate the value is not. And then we've got another time where it says string argument expression, which is this magical way that we passed in the text for the name of the value that we're specifying. So um, we, we sort of magically. But we never specified this parameter because we set the expression argument to a default value of null. Okay, we specified the default value of null. And then inside here, we, were, we went ahead and did what you'd expect to go ahead and check whether the value is null. Now the magical thing that happens here is because we have a caller argument expression, the compiler injects at compile time, the compiler will inject the string for value so that you no longer have to worry about from the caller's perspective, but you have access to it from the, 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 the callee's perspective. I am invoked, so now I know I can count on the argument expression to have the value for whatever's passed in, even if it was an expression, you know, three words long or ten words long, however complex that it was, it would still go ahead and resolve that and give you the entire text. So I could, for do, example, do something like... Um, uh, value, uh, uh, we, could, we could do something like this. Or whatever, and then the expression would come out on the other side to say that this was the actual value we passed with the string and the data and whatever appears inside that expression. It's really powerful because we get full debug capabilities with this. And in this case, we get that to appear in our, ex ex uh, in our exception message. But the same is true if you're trying to do debug, debug and there's a host of other scenarios where that's, that's really useful. So in that scenario you just did, what is the name of the variable? The variable? Which way? Here? Yeah, so back in your... Yeah, when you had the interpolated... This one, right? right. So it, it would be like doing this.
Oh. Yeah? That, in fact, it wouldn't be doing like that. It would be doing like this. Right? Because it passes the actual string that was used in the expression. So no, it's, there's no dollar. I intentionally deleted the dollar because it actually gives you the expression that was inside there. Oh, and sorry, I, I'm to be technically accurate here, it would be like this. Right? The expression is this, and instead of me having to type, retype the exact same thing, it does it for me and just injects it in. Really cool. So as a user, I think I'd use this all the time. I look forward to the testing frameworks, which, I mean, just imagine a test that did a cert, and in the assert, it automatically ingested the expression. So rather than you have assert and all these five things, you can know exactly which line it was on, what the expression was, because it gives you the entire expression. So testing libraries, debug libraries, uh, exception, throwing exceptions, really powerful. I'm going to use it all the time. It just turns out I'm not going to write that many of them, because there's not that many scenarios where they've written. But as a user, like I'm all into the user, the user side of the drug. Yes, question mark, that's kind of funny. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so the .NET framework certainly does, and we'll start to see more and more as frameworks get updated to support the expression. So the, the question was, sorry to repeat, does the framework come with a whole selection of those? And the answer is absolutely, and we'll start to see more against language. There's a couple uh, important uh, coding guidelines to think through as we do this, and I'll sort of walk you through these. First of all, um, I, I uh, intentionally here, in my case, I went ahead and said, this is going to be <clears throat> um, not nullable. So if somebody did for some reason, and I can't come up with a good one, but if for, somebody, some, for, if for some reason somebody did intentionally pass in the argument, I want them to know it should not be null, because I need the text. Right, so don't do this in next. So and this is one of those weird scenarios where I said, hey, don't, it, I'm making it not nullable by intent, but I'm actually assigning it null because there's no reason for you to go ahead and do this. And so the couple coding, gu coding guidelines here on for this caller argument expression is it should be not nullable declared, but you should assign it null, which is kind of goofy, but you get the point, right? In the end of the day, we want to make sure it's an, it's an optional parameter. We don't want to make it force you to put it in. That would be a pain. There's no point in having it then. But we, we want to make sure that it's, it's nobody does it by mistake and actually passes in, passes in null, to, null to that expression. Is there anything happening with the property initializer that's different? Or if you say I wanted to have a constructor, and then my constructor, I wanted to sign a private variable instead of a property. Did you use the same tool there? This is only, so the parameter itself is only, uh, the art attribute itself is only allowable on parameters. Um, it's actually restricted. Um, I'm not seeing it in here. Thank you. So thank you. That's exactly what I needed, Kelly. The, you'll notice the attribute usage here is only to use it on a parameter. So uh, you can use it any way you like as long as it's a parameter. Any other questions about, about this? Okay. Let's go a bit further. Um, last time we did, we, we, when we covered C sharp nine, we introduced a new concept called the record. Uh, and, and the, the advantage of the record was what, what is a record? What, what, what are the features that come with a record? It's some immutability characteristics. That's true. It does come with immutability. Uh, it's not, it's immutability as possible. You can, you have immutability. It's not, it's, it doesn't have to be immutable, but it does have the, the ability to be immutable, sure. What else? I mean, why would I, I mean, why would I declare something as, as a record? What, what is it? What are the features that are really come with? Uh, it does come with deconstruction, so it comes with the ability to go ahead and deconstruct it into its, its constituent parts, which is not the same as destructing it, just to be clear. Um, we can deconstruct it into its constituent parts. So in this case, it would be something like, like the latitude and, and um, the longitude could be, could be deconstructed out. Um, what else? 
Neither of these are things that I would have sort of said, oh, that's a good enough reason for me to create a record. So the, the typical, the motivating factor, I think, in creating records in the first place was uh, two factors. Number one, I get a significantly abbreviated ability to declare this. And you'll notice in this case, I've gone ahead and added parameters to the class declaration for longitude and latitude. And even though um, I, do, I do have a latitude math up property here, I do not have a longitude declaration because I get that automatically by the fact that I declared it as a record and I went ahead and put those parameters back to the constructor. Immutability, yes. So that, that was mentioned. So Sean mentions the whole point of immutability, which other people have talked about. Uh, it's a possible or it's easier to, declare, to get immutability is what I would, would say. Um, but, but a big feature here with records is the fact that we get to go ahead and, and declare them much more simply without all the ceremony that we might have, um, I might have used before by declaring these properties. There's another really important characteristic that I, I think is probably the most important one to be aware of. The others are niceties, but the really important, it's also nicety, I guess, uh, but the really important characteristic is we get identity when we go ahead and work with um, a record. And specifically what I mean by identity is that we can now do comparisons uh, between types and it's, no, it's gonna handle things like equality uh, and get hash code and it's gonna provide implementations of those methods without you having to write them yourself. And this is really important if you wanna say, hey, I wanted to compare these two person objects and wanna see if they equal. The default implementation of that is you're gonna do a reference equals. Are they the exact same instance? But if I can go get a quality to come out um, without going ahead and writing, what is actually a fairly difficult method, we've got to write equality. We've got to write not equality, which is presumably opposite. We've got to handle null. We've got to handle comparison to object. Uh, we've got to go ahead and do get, host, get hash code. We've got to worry about inheritance because it turns out the implementation for, for equality is actually more complex when you have inheritance scenarios you have to worry about. Um, and if you're going to be inherited from, you need to worry about you know, how that's going to be implemented and what, what are the override characteristics and what, where can you be virtual or not. Uh, it's, it's a fairly complex implementation. It's very much a templatized. You, know, you can go and install some you know, toolkits and get, get the template generation, but you're generating a, a significant amount of code. And it turns out that just comes by default when you do records. You just get it for free. And so this concept of identity just comes with record. And that's a pretty powerful, powerful feature. But it turns out that when we declared them in the past, it was done like this. We just went ahead and declared record. Oh, you want to see what I'm doing. Sorry about that. Um, so it turns out, I uh, just want to say, Emma, you're doing a great job. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, the, it turns out that before, we sort of had this concept, oh, when I declare a, a record, it's a different type. It's a different thing, right? We have structures, value types, we have reference types, and then we have records. And, and really, a record is just a class with some additional stuff injected into it, some additional code related to you know, uh, deconstruction and identity. And, and, and ability to debug it as well is another feature that we get. Uh, so why do we have to have it be a different type? Why don't we just have this be, I just want to add a keyword, or in this case, a contextual keyword. I want to add the contextual keyword record to the class so I can inject identity into it without saying, oh, this is a different concept. It's completely, you know, it's, it's, it's a record is a different thing. Uh, and from a way of sort of learning the language, it'd be much easier if I sort of said, oh, you can declare a class, and you can declare the class person, the person has a name and, and, and an age, and everything's hunky-dory, but then you need to do identity, and you're gonna generate a thousand lines of code, or you could just add the word record right before the declaration, but it's still a reference type. There's nothing special about it, other than the fact that it's got this identity, which you could have written by hand if you chose. Now, all of that is a great addition. You know, you wonder why it took them a, a second version to add this. Why didn't they just put it in the first version? We, we won't, you know, we won't, you know, issue any criticisms. Clearly, they were under a lot of stress and pressure and things like that. Um, but there's a problem. What if I wanted to do this for a value type? 
And it turns out the desire to do this for a value type sort of pushed them to have to create a different syntax for declaring records, which was exactly the syntax that I'm showing right here. So rather than doing this, which is now ambiguous, is it a value type or a reference type, will now allow you to do class, but we can go ahead and do it as a struct like this, and we just do record struct, and now we've gotten the ability to change a struct to be a record. <clears throat> and that's awesome, because we're no longer restricted. And it turns out that the places you most likely are going to want identity are going to be in the case of a struct. I mean, you want to make sure we're comparing the right things when we compare things. So naturally, it makes sense that we would go ahead and have a record struct, not just a record class. And you can still, of course, because of backwards compatibility, you can just say record without specifying class. That it's still a reference type. But I would suggest that going forward from a coding standard perspective, you probably want to just specify record class and record struct, and, and you're off, off to the races, you're off at dumb and happy. And of course, we get the, the same features. Now we can go ahead and declare these parameters after the, the declaration of the type, and automatically then we're going to get degrees and minutes and seconds as properties on a class. We can override the implementation, in this case making it support only init and be a read-only. So it's read-only until construction is completed. I mean, it's read-write until complex construction is completed, and then it becomes a read-only read property in the case of minutes. Um, One thing, uh, as with all value types, you do not want to go, uh, well, let me be clear. Uh, the default implementation is that your uh, value types are going to be read-only by default. In fact, you cannot, unlike with classes, you cannot go ahead and put read-only here. Uh, well, I guess I've changed it. You, uh, you can't put, oh no, I'm, I was mistaken. You can't put read-only on records. My memory may be failing here. Yes, yeah, so you can't, the modifier is not valid for the same. So on a class, you can't go ahead and put read-only, I apologize, but you can go ahead and put read-only on struct. And this is a very important characteristic because for years, we've always said structs should be read-only. And there's an important characteristic why structs should be read-only is because we want to prevent you from doing things like having methods like this, do not do this, do not do this at home, do not do this at work, do not do this anywhere. Um, why is this bad? Why is it bad to have a method that mutates the value type? So, one more time. Because they're supposed to be immutable, but why? I mean, yes, yes, that's true, but why is it so important that value types are immutable? Because their value is identity, we're close. Yeah, that we, we're, still, we're still close, yeah, yeah. We're, we're close, we haven't quite grokked it. What if you're inside a collection, okay? A list, for example. And the list collects, in this case, angles. That's great, okay, we're doing good. And then I go ahead and do a dot, I go ahead and dereference uh, or, or access a particular item in the list. So I go and access the first item or the zero item. I go ahead and do a dot, so brackets, zero, dot. And then I call reset longitude. What is the dot operator going to return to me? It's going to return to me a copy. I'm going to go ahead and put that on the stack. And then it's going to go ahead and change the copy by incrementing second by adding a value. Then the stack's going to unwind, throw away the copy I just modified, and give me back the original value. This is not a good problem, right? We've now sort of called a method to modify a value. It then, you know, invisibly created a copy, modified the copy, unwind the stack, threw away the copy, and gave us back the exactly the same thing we had before. Not a good scenario, right? And now in 1.0, it used to be possible to attempt to do this on a property. So for example, you could go do you know, the same thing. So I'm inside a list. I, I go ahead and index it with the, the, the square brackets and, and the value zero. And then I do a dot operation. And then I do longitude. And I assign it a new value. And early on, 
that would cause the same problem. The stuff would get copied and, pa and modified and then thrown away. But now we're going to get a, an error warning. The compiler is smarter. It says, wait a second, you're a value type. You should not be doing this. Like, that doesn't make sense. But it turns out they don't have the way, there's no way for them to yet to do code analysis inside the, inside the method. And so you could still write a method that has the same property. Or you could decorate your type with read only. And now you're going to make sure you don't make that mistake. And I would suggest in 99.9% .9 of the times when you're going to go ahead and declare a struct of any kind, you should go and do read only. Of course, the one scenario where all these rules have been thrown out is a tuple. It turns out the tuple doesn't use properties. There's a whole bunch of magic. You can actually, I've written, so you can search my name in tuples, it probably shows up. But um, th there's some really good reason why tuple got to escape all the rules that we previously set up for structs. But in the end of the day, I, I would strongly recommend that you go with the, uh, hey, let's just go ahead and declare our structs as read only. And you, you don't suffer the consequences, and you can go ahead and make modifications. Um, there are some catches that I think are still there. I, you know, I, I point them out. For example, in this case, I've gone ahead and declared it read only, and I'm assigning second seconds, which is obviously dumb. Like, why would you go ahead and change it? Uh, so there's, there's limitations of what you could do this in terms of your properties. But this is a dumb declaration anyway, so we don't really need to assign seconds. This thing value it is, has already. It was just an example for you guys to see what, what's going on. Um, so you could override. So for example, you could say seconds uh, plus you know, 42, because what other number would you use? Uh, again, then I would also want to go ahead and declare seconds with a knit, and I'd you know, get into, into a space like that. Make sense? We'll just leave the warning there for, for hits and giggles. Um, there's another important characteristic that we get with, um, with records, and that is the ability to return a clone, which is a fairly frequent operation. Hey, we want to take the value we have. We want to return it. But because it's immutable, we want to return the same thing, just modified slightly because we can't modify the original. And we don't want to modify the original for the reasons I've already gone into. And you'll notice there's this new contextual keyword, very subtle. It's, it's just beautifully, it's a four-letter word. You'll, know, you'll notice that. And it's the, the four-letter word with. So I can take the value that I have. In this case, it's something called first. And I can say with that, let's go ahead and uh, add um, in, in this case, add an angle to first. So we can sort of rotate it, if you, if you like. And so we can go ahead and add a second angle, so we can go ahead and, and move, this, move this around you know, a, um, a point. And in this case, we're going to go ahead and do the angle, the angle operator. And we're going to use the width operator that says, take this, clone it, and then make these mod modifications with inside the width, this, the scope of the width statement. Right? Mega cool. Um, the important thing to note is we can still go ahead and declare our type as read-only because we're not modifying the original. We're returning a clone. And in the clone operation, we're making a modification so that the clone is returned with new values set up as part of, as part of what we're doing. Questions? Comments? Yes. Yes. What's the... The first line doing there, just about with adding the first and second. Uh, yeah, I was just doing a tuple there. It turns out that I, that I probably could have done this more efficiently, but it was a. Um, I needed to add, do the add operation, and so that, that's that's what's going on on there, and then working with the. First. Yeah, I, I obviously could have taken these statements, and put this in here for seconds. You know, I could have just injected that there. That would have been fine. But you'll notice I use it multiple times, so I need to save the value. And it was, you know, I, I tried a few times to put this on one line, and then it, it didn't fit in the editor. So I, I simplified it just because, you know, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, a couple things to, 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 to highlight. We, we talked about frequency of usage. Uh, do you see this as something you're going to use all the time? Something you're going to use occasionally? 
What, where, what would you say is your, 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 your usage for record struct? When is, so question one was, when is EF going to go ahead and return these? And, and what's interesting about the question is mostly EF is not returning structs, right? I mean, so we don't really have, have EF. It's, it's you're almost always working with classes in, in, the, in the what's generated. So I, I don't know when they're going to change that. I would imagine that's a fairly difficult to change with backwards compatibility. But you know, we've had some pretty significant changes in EF that we've all cursed. So we should be careful what we ask for. I don't know. Well, I, right, that's the point. Is it's, it's only working with, yeah. Um, but, but remember that EF can work with whatever type you declare. So you can go ahead and declare your types. That's not, that's not an issue. I, I, this has been disputed. I actually had a conversation with the C-sharp team about this. Um, you know, it, it's, it's arguable that you will start using record structs a lot more often because they're so much easier, easier to declare. And, and I think that's true. However, I still think it's relatively rare you're going to have to declare a struct. Like the value types, they're limited in terms of size, in terms of being memory efficient, so you don't copy operations all over the place. Um, and and I, I think that it's, it's relatively rare that we're going to suddenly, oh, let's go ahead and declare a thousand record types. I, I look at this from the concept of a writer trying to come up with good examples that don't exist already when I need to write a record type. It's fairly difficult. Like, there's just not a lot of cases like, oh my goodness, there's so many cases where I need a record value type. It's, it's just not that common. So I, I think it's rare, but it's certainly easier to do. They are complex to write. If you know, I look at my book, like just talking about value types is a, is a complex topic. There's lots of pitfalls. You know, that's an entire chapter on its own. And, and really, I think this makes it a lot, a lot simpler, a lot simpler to do. So we will comment out read only. So the code goes back to compiling. Okay, any questions about that? Got a bunch of tests, you don't need to see those. Um, there's some corner cases here regarding uh, definitive assignments. So there were some cases that you, you would encounter your code where you didn't, couldn't quite figure out what the type was. And so now there's an ability to go ahead and do this. You guys can look it up. But uh, essentially, you got an error um, that you, you no longer get because you're, it knows what the type is. Um, but I, I would argue that these are cases where this, um, you only knew about this because your code didn't compile. And now it does, so it just works. So you don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about it. Um, oh, there's one other characteristic on struct that I forgot to point out that's actually pretty important. Mark, just to clarify. Yeah. Neil, you can only use when uh, the record. Uh, I'm trying to think. I've only, you can use it with a normal class. Yeah, it should work. No, I think it's the same. I, I haven't done that. I've only used it with records, I confess, but I think it works with anything. Good question. Um, I forgot to mention this. Uh, you can now declare structs with your own. Um... Nope, that's not it. Do I have an example of this? It looks like I failed to have an example on this. But you can now put constructors, default constructors, on, uh, on structs. So angle. Uh, what am I missing? The constructor declared as a record with a parameter list must have this constructor initializer. I can't remember the syntax for this. Why is that not?
I don't, I don't remember. Let me put this outside of here so I can get it, get it right. I don't know how that happened. You would have thought my, my editor would just correct mistakes like that. Yeah, I don't know how that is possible. Yeah. So you weren't able to go ahead and define default constructors, uh, and now that is possible. Um, so that's an additional feature I forgot to mention related to structures. You can now have a default constructor on a struct, which was previously po not possible. Sorry, I forgot, forgot that. Um, oh, here's, here's a really interesting feature. Um, and, and some usage case scenarios. So you'll notice that occasionally we want to go ahead and do uh, um, using like strings where uh, we do string interpolation, but we can't because the value is calculated at runtime rather than compile time. And, and obviously inside a, a, an attribute here, in this case I'm using the, the obsolete attribute, uh, you, can, you have to use a literal. Right, so it has to be compile time defined. It has to be a literal. And it turns out, you'll notice I can use string interpolation here for this constant, and it allows me to do it even though it has to be a string literal. So essentially, this is happening compile time, not at runtime. And that's, that's I think, a, a, significant, uh, a significant enhancement. You'll notice the other example I have here is I've gone, I've gone ahead and declared three constants, and then I've combined them together using string interpolation, and again, uh, I can do that even though this large variable, this last variable here, quote, is done as a uh, string interpolation. So just just a, a subtle nicety or a, a nicety that you can have there in, in terms of using it. Uh, one disadvantage I will point out back on color arguments. Um, you'll notice I actually didn't mention this, and it's excuse me for going back. Of course, when I went ahead and did the argument expression, I had to specify what was the thing that I wanted to go ahead and have be the expression, because you could, of course, have multiple expressions. I, I happen to only have two, I have only have one here, but I could have many, and I want to identify which variable contains the expression that I want to use, and so I go ahead and specify in here, oh, for sure, you want to go ahead and use argument to identify the expression uh, that, that to again identify the value, no, to identify the parameter that the string expression is being pulled from. Now, it, it's kind of unfortunate what I'd really like to do is name of here, but it turns out that you can't do name of something that doesn't exist in the scope, so that's not possible um, because it's not inside, inside the scope. Argument is not inside the scope of where you're actually currently working. So that feature is not in there, but it has been proposed. So we'll, maybe we'll see that in a, in a future version. I'm jumping around here, forgive me. Uh, so string interpolate strings, there's a bunch of stuff with sealed, um, uh, sealed strings to test that, again, I think this is, is, is not the most important. Uh, we've probably covered the most, the most major things here. Um, so you can go ahead, um, and, and mark methods as, as seals when you go ahead and derive here. So I've, I'm going to do a two-string method, and I can mark the two-string here as sealed. Uh, in corner case scenarios, line directives, there's a bunch of stuff in line directives. In this case, we can go ahead and say specify, hey, this is the line number that we want the error to come out as, and so we can specify where that happens. Uh, again, we're getting to some pretty corner debug scenarios. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, yes, exactly. Um, oh, here's the default constructor. I did have it. I should move this up in my, in my talk. I should move this higher up. So here's a default constructor um, with, with the this parameter, uh, and it's going to go ahead and invoke this. Oh, that's, oh, that was the problem with the previous example I had. I forgot. So if you go ahead and do a this initializer, you, of course, had to go ahead and call the constructor that was specified in the declaration of the type. So in this case, the reason why I had the error message before was because I didn't have this, and now that's the same. that was the same message I forgot. Uh, so here's the thing, hey, you got to go ahead and call the constructor before so that we're now chaining our constructors together and we get the common invocation. Uh, good, a good error message, I just was caught off guard into what that was for. Any more questions? Yes? Could we backtrack a little bit? Talk about, but I'm playing with it, and not sure I quite understand it. Um, if inside this one, 
file based namespaces? Uh, <laughs> the second smaller argument expression. Yes. Bit. Yes. Um, so I added like a write line inside of there to write out the argument and then the argument expression. And I, from what you were saying, I was expecting that if I did like string interpolation or something as the argument, then when I printed it out, I would see. Uh, so let's do it. I got a test here. We can actually go ahead and okay. do the scenario you're talking about. So, yeah, let's, let's put an F9 here. Uh, let's go ahead and put, um, I think we're going to have to delimit our if statement too. Well, it'll still be fine. So we can go ahead and put value. Put a dollar. And right, now I need a test. So let's go back to So I'm going to do this in a test here, just because I got a test written for this one. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, can we do that? Uh, I think another question. So in your case, could it be resolved at compile time? What the so the, the issue that oh, this is a really interesting scenario. So the issue that that Joseph is talking about, I think, uh, is that he went ahead and used um, string interpolation in a constant. Is that correct? Is it a constant? So he used string interpolation to constant. So the compiler went and handled the string interpolation at compile time, converted it to be the actual constant value, and then called the compiler attribute. But, it, but by then, it had already been replaced. So, the so it's, I, I, I didn't even consider the scenario. So you talk, I was like, wait a second, what's going on? So what's happening is, which comes first? At compile time, that value was changed into a constant. So at runtime, it didn't actually have the expression anymore. Um, it should be possible. I, I, let's, let's just see. I'm, I'm guessing that's what happened. Uh, let's do a dollar. Forty-two. Can I do that? Forget it. Let's just copy my test. Way easier. Um, and here we're going to go ahead and pass this like that. As string interpolation. Oh, details. This is the best thing about coding in front of a live audience. Quick yeah, we good? Um, I'm hoping not. Let's see. Oh, because I didn't change it? Oh, that's a good question. Let's find out. Yeah, no, I get it. I understand. So it came in as data. 
Um, and what did we call it from? So let's go back to my, that's not very interesting in this case, but yeah, so it's coming in as data. Let's try it just to make sure. Let's go ahead and, there's my test. What if we took data and made it a constant outside of the function? Sure, I guess. You guys starting Twitch yet? My naming conventions? No, I, I, I'm changing it. So I'm intentionally changing it here. So let's rename everything. So let's try that. So the argument is now and the argument stretch in here is data. So it's the variable coming through. Oh, I didn't change it yet. Yep, yep, I'm working. I did here. I just want to do something different here. Just passing data. What am I missing? Huh? Oh, wait. Which test is running? I've, I've hidden everything here. Let's see if we can view our windows. Where's call stack? See? Okay, we're in here. Oh, we're right here. It's the first method. We're not down at this one yet. Follow what I'm saying? Sorry about that. I called this guy twice. Meaning I have, there's two asserts in here. By the way, you should never do that. No, I'm just kidding. So what's cool about this scenario is it, it, um, it actually allows you to put two asserts. So this is a really interesting scenario. You can now put two asserts in a single test because it can differentiate between the two based on the messages you got coming out. Um, so it's actually a really interesting scenario. Control RT. Sorry about that. That's not what it. Oh, it's close. Oh, stink. Okay, you can barely see it here. But you'll notice that it has, man, I really want to get that in there. Just it's too quick. Can you screen, screenshot it? <laughs> wow. Okay, anyway, we did it. So you'll notice that the day is coming in. What's really interesting about the scenario that, that I, I think really shows the power of this is now when I can put two asserts in here, Um, I can now differentiate between this one and this one by the data that I'm actually passing. So you can actually do, you know, fairly complex stuff. In this case, say it throws exception. Um, I could do something like, I could change throws, assert.throws to pass the expression 
in. So as soon as this framework supports the throws and you actually take that in, it would actually give you this entire statement as your expression, as your string expression, and then this entire statement as your spring expression, and you could actually tell which one was running, and you could now start to run two uh, asserts in there and be able to differentiate between which one's failing, at least on the first one. Now, uh, I believe that XUnit actually allows you to go ahead and uh, do multiple asserts and then catch them all at the end, just which ones, you know, but it's the same point as you can then get the valid message coming out and which line is actually doing the assertion rather than following the best practice, which is one assert per, per test. Interesting scenario. Um, so there's an interesting simplification into your pattern matching that we can start doing now. I've got the original syntax here. We used to use curly brackets to differentiate as sort of your, uh, in terms of navigating into a, uh, a type. So in this case, we've got person, the person has a name, and the name property has a, I mean, the name has a length property, and you navigated that using curly brackets. A significant improvement in the pattern matching syntax is that we can now just go person, uh, put curly brackets for the first one, is operative curly brackets, then I can do name dot length, uh, rather than again this, this duplicated uh, uh, curly brackets. I think this is like always used. I can't imagine doing pattern matching. If you're gonna go inside the, the if you're gonna navigate the hierarchy through properties, I'm just gonna use dot notation uh, and, and be able to navigate into that. Note, of course, of that if we encounter a null somewhere, it's going to handle that scenario because it's going to return the pattern. So you're not going to get a null reference exception. Whereas the whole idea is if you do dot notation and one of those things is null, you're going to get a null reference exception. That's not happening because we're using pattern matching. We just fail the pattern matching, so it just works. Questions? Um, I don't think so. Or I meant in inside the uh, I should have put it on the wrong other side, regardless. Uh, yeah, you can't. It 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 would be meaningless to do that, right? It doesn't it doesn't. What is that? What does that mean? It's it's an unnecessary. You're adding complexity that doesn't make sense. Any questions online, Aaron? <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful about when they're just chatting amongst themselves and when they actually want to ask a question of everybody. That's that's hard. Okay, that's all I have. We're, we're done. Um, a couple just high level comments that would sort of summarize uh, to remember some of the coding guidelines that I would go forward to use. Uh, a lot of this comes out or extrapolated out from when I say always use versus not always use. I think it'd be worthwhile to go into existing code and change the code to eliminate uh, duplicate using statements, using declarations. I would just scrap it out. So I would literally go into code and just do a search on using the system colon, semicolon, get rid of them and add a global using. Uh, either putting it inside the project or inside, uh, or, or inside the, or inside a global usings.cs file. Uh, I, I read somewhere that was happened in the framework and they eliminated, they had like 95,000 uh, lines of code changed. And just okay to scope namespaces to remove the curly brackets for, to make them file scoped instead of uh, instead of curly braces scoped. It was something like ninety five thousand uh, lines changed in a single PR request for the .NET framework. Right? Oh. Okay, so I was off by an order of magnitude on the number of lines changed nine hundred and fifty thousand lines. Um, I imagine you could sort of scale down from like a terabyte of storage to like 100 gigabytes if you don't need that kind of change. But it's a worthwhile enough thing for me that I think I would go back into existing code bases, 
Once I upgraded to C sharp 10, and I would go ahead and eliminate those curly braces, I would eliminate the, the I would go ahead and, and you start using uh, global namespaces. The other thing, interesting thing about the global namespaces is you could put the global namespace statements in without changing the code if you didn't want to go through searching and search and place and all that kind of stuff. And then whenever you encounter the file, you could go ahead and eliminate the, the using declaration. Aaron. What is the oldest framework you can use with C sharp 10? I don't know. Like the official answer, I don't know. Almost certainly you can use C sharp 9. Um, I mean, I'm almost certain you can use .NET 5. I have, obviously you can use .NET, .NET Framework, you might have a problem with. I have .NET Framework, I think 4.8 works, 4.5 I think works. Uh, I've heard that there are other frameworks before 4.5. I've heard that there's .NET Core Frameworks before 5.0. I have no idea anything about them. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, you know, how far back on the OS can you go? And I know that there was operating systems before Windows 10, but I, I don't recall what they were called, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, it's a valid question and a good question. I just, I just don't know before .NET 5. Um, I'm almost certain there's support. I just don't know how far back you can go. Let us know what the answer is. Do you know if there's a... Slash in. CPP? CP slash M. Spell it out for us, Jack. <laughs> oh, it's operating system. Okay, maybe. So, do you know? It Okay, <laughs> it is an operating system. Good, right? But of course, all I they just got clear. We know. Does it work on OS two? Yes, yes, yes. I do have a box for OS two warp. Just you know, just collection my collection. Actually, I think it might be up there. Now I think about it, but I don't know. Okay. Is, is there a way in Visual Studio to say, say new class to leave the namespace curly braces out? And I started I started working down that road of just take out all the curly braces. Then I realized that every time I create a new class, I have to delete stuff. It's easier to delete. Does Visual Studio 2022 do the no curly braces by default now? Just the template. I don't know. That's why. So I, I know on the command line, the templates are updated, but they're distributed by NuGet. So as long as it matches your NuGet, I'm not sure where Visual Studio is at. So part, part of why I'm, I, can, I don't know these answers is not that you know, this was a smart thing to do, but I installed Visual Studio right before this talk. Uh, it, you know, it, it's a fairly large install, and I installed Visual Studio 2022 preview, and I installed this one. So I had no idea what it was going to do when I did new class, because I, I wrote the code beforehand. Uh, what it's doing right now is it's showing me that it still has uh, um, curly braces scope in, in the file rather than file based scope. I, I don't know where that where it is. I do know that this is these are templates on your hard drive. You can change these. I just don't know why they didn't put it into Visual Studio. Um, and, um, what I'd really like to say is always. Can you set it up in your code style? Because I'm thinking of teamwork, right? You don't. Yeah, no. I so all these are questions I don't. I don't know. In, as I say, I. I um, oh, look at that! Until recently, the Visual Studio wasn't and, doing a simplified Hello World project as well and stuff like that. So. Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question. I assume the other thing you could do with like the you could, you could set up all your global units, and I know I don't know what the actual command is. It's just Control R G, whatever that. Yeah. Is. Okay. So for to get the using statements at the top of your file. Right, and not, and I know there's an option where you can set it up when I hit compile to just automatically run that again. Yes. Everything yeah. That right. Clean up everything on that. Yeah. So to so do things like eliminate the the. The, these, for example, because they're no longer needed and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, I know there's a refactor on here, so yeah. unnecessary usings, you can go ahead and do those, and I can do it for the entire solution. Yeah, I don't know the command is. I just know the keyboard shortcut. Yeah. yeah, well, control period is going to go ahead and do this and allow you to operate on the entire solution. Right, this, this will do that change that I'm talking about, which was 90, 955,000 lines. 
And you can do it in, so the st Kali statement is you can do it inside editor config. And um, so coding standards, I've talked about you should make your string expression on the caller attribute. Um, you should make that nullable, non-nullable, even though you're assigning a null to make it an optional attribute. Uh, I've talked about always using record class and record struct rather than just record. I just think it's that's a useful uh, sort of standard to put in place. I would always use file-based namespace declarations. I would definitely use global uh, using declarations. I think those those are super super helpful. Um, I would almost always, I think actually I'd say, I would, yeah, I can't really say always, but almost always use read only in the declarations on my struct records, my record structs. Uh, I think that's, that's a, a best practice for sure to go ahead and, and do that. Um, I, I will use caller, there's no, it's not really a coding standard thing, but I use caller argument expressions whenever I can, but I'm not gonna declare that many of them. Um, the other stuff is more usage, not really coding standards, I think, related that I can, that I can come up with, so. Thank you, everyone, I appreciate it. <laughs>